This video um, represents the material I use at the end of my second unit in prehistoric life after going through all of the diverse groups of dinosaurs, just to kind of bring everything together, talk about dinosaurs in general and the Mesozoic era in general. If it seems a little more disjointed as far as jumping from, you know, this movie to this PowerPoint slide to this, you know, activity, etc., it's perhaps because of that. It's kind of tying topics together uh, at the very end, so I apologize for that. Um, so one of the things, having uh, studied, you know, the bones of dinosaurs, uh, I, I mentioned a little bit, is the idea of trace fossils. So um, this is Dilophosaurus, and there uh, is a fossil genus named uh, Eubrontes. And if you go to Dinosaur State Park in Connecticut, which I highly recommend, uh, one sees an incredible uh, set of trackways. I think the largest um, continuous uh, trackways, at least in Eastern North America, if not North America. Um, but uh, you don't have the bones of the actual dinosaur. It's thought to be a Dilophosaurus-like animal just based on uh, these characteristics. But here's an example of sometimes you get information about dinosaurs from what are called trace fossils, not necessarily part of their body, um, but nevertheless, they have left uh, signs, which then you know, help you to learn a bit more about dinosaurs and uh, the world. So in addition to, you know, if you went to Dinosaur State Park, you know, you'd be able to, um, uh, uh, to walk and see uh, that. I just wanted to jump to a couple of uh, the illustrations. Um, when you look at dinosaur trackways, obviously dinosaurs had different types of feet. And then one could uh, look at the shapes of uh, these and identify them uh, uh, to groups, but then also perhaps glean a little more information. So here's a question, did dinosaurs drag their tails? When I was, you know, growing up and look at, you know, as a kid looking at dinosaur books, certainly all dinosaurs were depicted with like a lizard-like tail dragging behind them, but now no one, you know, no illustrations of dinosaurs depict that. So why? Well, one is, is the trackways just don't show tra tail marks. Now, occasionally a tail does touch the ground. Occasionally the very tip of the a, tr a tail might uh, drag, or a dinosaur might sit down, and then you would see the tail. But for the most part, dinosaur trackways just don't show tail marks. And so that early depiction of dinosaurs where they're all dragging their tails in you know, a lizard-like um, fashion, um, that uh, seems then to be incorrect. We could corroborate that with other pieces of evidence. So, for example, especially in the ornithischian uh, dinosaurs, uh, their uh, tails had these ossified tendons, which would have made them rigid. All right, and so you know, here's another piece of evidence which corroborates that dinosaurs probably many of them weren't capable of dragging their tails on the ground because of this. But so here's an example of something that you could glean about dinosaurs from their footprints, not actually part of their, um, uh, their body per se. Um, here you can see that um, dinosaurs walk on their toes. They have this elongated foot and we can see that. So here's just a dinosaur walking on its toes. If it were to say touch, you know, sit down on the ground, then you could see um, more of the, um, uh, of uh, uh, the footprint. Um, some footprints indicate that dinos uh, some dinosaurs had webbing between their toes or claws or hooves. And so once again, this would be something that one wouldn't otherwise have a knowledge uh, of. Uh, another thing that one could uh, gather is, uh, you know, some animals could be either bipedal or quadrupedal. And so you could get an idea of, um, uh, of that. Um, one could, you know, look at footprints and wonder whether you actually had a trackway of, say, a theropod chasing its prey. You know, do you see theropod footprints um, moving in uh, the same direction as a, um, as a, a prey uh, item? Um, then there are uh, other things that we can uh, glean. Uh, so uh, were din did dinosaurs travel in groups? Did they migrate? Well, if you see lots of footprints of similar animals walking apparently in the same direction, now that is in proof. They could have obviously been made at you know different points of a day, um, but it does you know support the idea 
that perhaps uh, uh, dinosaurs, you know, could have um, have migrated. Um, in sauropod tracks, uh, there is an example known where the large examples are the large footprints are on the outside, and then the um, and smaller ones are on the inside. That's perhaps offering um, evidence of parental care, where there was a herd that you know sheltered uh, the smaller. Uh, individuals. And so this is an example of what are called trace fossils, you know, perhaps not part of the, uh, the body uh, per se, um, but nevertheless one can get uh, information about uh, the dinosaurs uh, from it. Um, eggs would fit into the category. Um, dinosaur eggs can vary in size. Some are laid singly, some are laid in groups, and then one can um, gather evidence uh, about that. Um, sometimes there are in the vicinity of uh, nests uh, infants found and as in the duck-billed uh, dinosaurs if the infants are of, um, of different ages then that would then uh, suggest that they stayed in the vicinity of the nest for a while. So some duck-billed dinosaur nests suggest that um, uh, a whole group nested together because there's multiple nests in an area, uh, that uh, the, a nesting site was used year after year because you might have a nest and then some sediment, nest and then some sediment, and that even that there was then parental care um, at uh, some of uh, the nest uh, sites. And so that's an example of some evidence. Um, there was a protoceratops nest found with a dead velociraptor in the vicinity, um, perhaps being evidence of velociraptor attempting to prey on the nest and a parent protoceratops defending the nest. There are two um, theropod dinosaurs uh, which have been pres preserved over the eggs, oviraptor and uh, troodon. There are other types of trace fossils as well. So some animals today and some dinosaurs swallowed stones and then these stones would then churn in the stomach and help grind up plant material. So in addition to perhaps chewing with their mouths, which mammals and some ornithischian dinosaurs did, some uh, animals can grind the food here and one notices that over time the stones can become worn down. These are easily identified as gastroliths if they're preserved with the animal. Sometimes they're passed in feces, and while this might, you know, be recognized as a gastrolith, you know, it would be difficult to, um, you know, to prove if it was isolated. Now, since this is just a swallowed stone, it doesn't really have additional information about the organism itself. Um, feces can fossilize and they can be known as coprolites. Um, now, uh, coprolites uh, may not have that much information um, if, especially in a plant-eating animal where it might simply have fibrous uh, material. Um, however, meat-eating animals might include, say, fish scales or bones, which would give some information about um, the diet of uh, the animal. Um, every now and then, however, uh, coprolites do yield useful information, um, and so perhaps they are understudied. So, for example, uh, Fossils of grass plants are not known until the Cenozoic era, but at the very end of the Mesozoic era, there is a sauropod coprolite which preserves grass or grass-like plants. And so if one were asking, when did this very important group of plants uh, evolve, coprolites might actually preserve the earliest a uh, uh, remnant of, of grasses uh, which predate any actual fossils of, uh, of grasses. Now obviously we would like to know a lot about uh, uh, dinosaurs, about how uh, they lived. Um, so for example, were they uh, warm-blooded, uh, oh I'm sorry, let me get back to that. Um, so uh, how did um, uh, uh, they live? Uh, well, so uh, there is some suggestion that some could uh, be in groups. And so for example, uh, there were a number of small Deinonychus predators found around a big uh, ornithopod prey item, um, suggesting maybe that Deinonychus hunted in a pack. Uh, and uh, in this one struggle with this uh, herbivore, which ultimately died, some of the small predators died as well. There are footprints you know, going many in the same 
uh, direction, which suggests that, you know, perhaps, you know, there were migratory routes uh, that animals uh, lived in uh, groups. Um, so uh, there are mass accumulations of bones in one area, which once again suggests that maybe they lived uh, in groups. Certainly the idea that many of them had crests, you know, some were sexually dimorphic crests, as in the hadrosaurs, um, that uh, the social aspects of dinosaur life uh, were more complex uh, than, uh, uh, than originally thought. Dinosaurs were often just kind of associated with you know, big dumb lizards, you know, if, if one will. Um, and so uh, therefore, you know, a lot of these, you know, trace fossils or interpretations of fossil sites might give more information. Uh, so once again, we would love to piece together information uh, about some dinosaurs. And so maybe, you know, if you found uh, dinosaur bite marks, like a tyrannosaur bite mark on a triceratops hips, which had been, um, uh, found, um, then uh, that is, uh, you know, perhaps indicative of diet or footprints leading to uh, a, uh, a skeleton of a sauropod indicative of, uh, of diet. There are some uh, examples where an animal is preserved in the gut. So Compsognathus, one specimen had a lizard in its uh, gut. Um, or uh, one dinosaur is known to have had a bird in uh, its uh, gut, or um, a feathered dinosaur having a mammal in its gut, or Spinosaurus with a pterosaur in its gut, or Baryonyx with a fish. Um, either way, um, that implies something about diet. Once again, if there are sexually dimorphic crests, that implies something about dinosaurs. If um, there are nasal regions uh, here. That suggests perhaps they made calls, which might be important, say, at, at mating uh, time or um, uh, or at for you know to get a group together or to warn group members of a predator. Um, there are examples of animals sitting on a nest, uh, preserving it. So Oviraptor troodon uh, are known to have uh, done that, as is a Psittacosaurus, a, um, uh, a Ceratopsian. Um, and so uh, we would love to know how dinosaurs uh, lived. And so things like footprints or read, trying to interpret, you know, things about their pathways, you know, the fact that they were bipedal, um, uh, etc. Uh, so a lot of fossil uh, specimens might uh, have uh, helped uh, with uh, that. Okay. Um, one of the questions that we would very much like to answer is, were dinosaurs warm-blooded or cold-blooded? Now, not only do we want to know that, but if we wanted to estimate how long they lived, how fast they grew, how much food they would have needed to have uh, eaten, um, we need to answer that question. Because if you don't know the answer to that question, you can't answer the other ones. Uh, because uh, being warm blood versus cold blooded has such a profound um, effect on uh, on an organism's uh, physiology. Now, this snake is quote cold blooded or ectothermic, um, where its body temperature is governed by its surroundings. But mammals and birds are endothermic in that they will always maintain the same body temperature uh, regardless of the um, uh, the outside temperature. Um, but that's much more expensive. You need far more energy to power a warm-blooded metabolism, an endothermic metabolism. Now, even though today mammals and birds are endothermic warm-blooded, so are other things. I mean, there are bees, dragonflies, moths, some sharks, and other fish, which constantly maintain a warmer body temperature than the surroundings and, and maintain their, their temperature. So for example, if it's a cold morning, a bee will shake and then its muscle contractions will then warm its body, just as we do when we shiver to maintain a warmer uh, body temperature. So endothermy is known in multiple groups, some fish, some insects. Uh, and so knowing whether um, dinosaurs were endothermic, they certainly could have been. Um, the problem is, if we were to, you know, make this argument, were dinosaurs warm-blooded or not, we would find certain things. Like, for example, some were covered by downy feathers. That is one of the things that helps birds be uh, endothermic. Um, so very well, you know, it could have helped the dinosaurs as well. Um, however, though, some dinosaurs had sails. Now, 
you know, we could argue sails might have been used for certain uh, different things. Um, but there were sauropods which had um, uh, which had uh, sails. Uh, there were ornithopods which had uh, sails. Um, a sail is just essentially lengthened vertebrae. But here's an ornithopod, which is sail. Here's a theropod, which is sail. Outside the Philadelphia Museum of Natural History, you can see a margosaurus, a, a sauropod, which had a sail. Spinosaurus, a theropod, which had a sail. And so um, if these were used for thermoregulation, then uh, one could argue that uh, these animals were cold-blooded because now they're sunning themselves and uh, using uh, that uh, to help themselves. The fact that dinosaurs walked erect, today the only animals that walk erect are uh, warm-blooded uh, ones. Um, uh, dinosaurs had predator-to-prey ratios, which uh, suggest that they uh, were uh, warm-blooded. The number of holes in the bones uh, for blood vessels in dinosaurs suggest that they were uh, warm-blooded. Um, large dinosaurs probably couldn't have been warm-blooded, not in the sense that we know, because that would have meant, you know, they, their just thick girth would have generated so much heat that it would have been difficult uh, to lose. So they couldn't have been warm-blooded in our sense. But then on the flip side, maybe because they were so thick um, that um, uh, that then they would have been almost warm-blooded by default. Today, warm-blooded animals have the largest brains, and dinosaur brains varied. Some had very small brains, like uh, sauropods and armored dinosaurs. Um, but the theropod dinosaurs, uh, they had brains which were in bird range and some even within mammal range. And so maybe small brains are an evidence of, um, of small uh, of uh, being cold-blooded, large brains of being warm-blooded, perhaps. Um, dinosaurs don't have turbinates in their nasal cavity, which the warm-blooded animals use uh, uh, to limit uh, water uh, loss. Um, as we look at footprints and try to estimate speeds, um, it might uh, be that dinosaurs uh, were capable of, you know, speeds and locomotion, more typical of warm-blooded um, uh, animals. Uh, and so, you know, we could go into many different um, uh, scenarios. Uh, Warm-blooded animals being more expensive need to get more energy from the food they eat. And the fact that uh, the duck-billed dinosaurs and horned dinosaurs uh, could uh, then um, uh, chew their food might be evidence that they had higher metabolic needs. Um, birds are warm-blooded and birds evolved from dinosaurs. Maybe evidence that at least as some of them were warm-blooded. Um, um, dinosaurs were known from Antarctica and from above the Arctic Circle. Now, while the world was not as cold in the Mesozoic uh, is today, then, um, but nevertheless, it did get cold. Uh, and so that might suggest that they were warm-blooded living in those, uh, those habitats. Although you might say, well, maybe they just migrated there in the warm months. Fine, but no cold-blooded animals have migration routes that, um, uh, that uh, long. So maybe even that uh, is, um, is indicative of being warm-blooded. Some uh, pterosaurs, which are uh, related to dinosaurs, um, had a, you know, fluffy covering around uh, their body, you know, once again suggesting, you know, perhaps they were warm-blooded uh, as, uh, as well. Now, I've been treating it as an either-or scenario. You're either warm-blooded or you're cold-blooded, um, but obviously that's not the case. Even among mammals today, uh, the egg-laying mammals are warm-blooded, but not to the same degree that the placental mammals are. And some have asked, might some dinosaurs have been warm-blooded and others cold, like the meat-eating dinosaurs warm-blooded? Might animals have varied depending on where they lived? Might they have been more warm-blooded when they were young and you know, cold-blooded when they were older? The, the point is, this is an important question. We don't know the answer. And you could make arguments on either side. There are some uh, attributes which would lead you to believe that maybe dinosaurs were cold-blooded, others warm-blooded. The warm-blooded support outnumbers the cold-blooded, so there's more reason to argue that dinosaurs were warm-blooded than cold-blooded. Um, but one, uh, we don't know. You could make arguments on either side. And obviously dinosaurs being this big diverse group that lived for, you know, 160 million years over an entire planet, um, 
they didn't necessarily all have to adapt the same physiology. They could have uh, varied, or they could have been more creative than we are. You know, for example, you know, uh, one type of metabolism when young, a different type of metabolism when older and reaching, you know, such a large uh, size. So this is a very important question. Unfortunately, um, coming to the answer uh, to it would be difficult. As I start to wrap up and get to why dinosaurs uh, died, um, I make a couple of other points to my classes. One is the Mesozoic is often referred to as the age of dinosaurs or the age of reptiles. Um, but I personally, I don't like that term. And so I just kind of remind my students at this point, um, you know, even though we spend a lot of time looking at dinosaurs, because dinosaurs are, are so fascinating, one needs to remember, you know, all of the other living things which existed in uh, the Mesozoic. Um, and so I've got two playlists uh, which, you know, go through this. I'll, I'll just highlight them here. Um, but so, for example, one, go, one goes to the Morrison form, uh, Formation and studies the fossils there. Obviously, um, you know, what leaps out are the big sauropod dinosaurs or the remains of allosaurus, et cetera. Um, but it should be remembered, well, there are fish known, you know, from these fossil beds. And that's important because the teleost fish, the fish which make up almost all bony fish alive today, they originated in the Mesozoic era. The Mesozoic was not just the age of dinosaurs, it was the age of teleost fish, the dominant fish alive today. The Morrison Formation has remains of frogs and salamanders. They were both, you know, born, they originated in the Mesozoic era, um, as did Sicilians. So, uh, the Mesozoic was not just the age of dinosaurs, but also the age of the frogs, the salamanders, and the Sicilians, which have survived to uh, the modern uh, day. Um, the Tuatara's relatives originated here. Snakes originated in the, um, the Mesozoic. Lizards, we could argue, because at the end of the Paleozoic, there are animals which some have called lizards, some have called lizard ancestors, so we could argue over lizards. Um, the first turtles are from the Mesozoic. The first crocodiles are from uh, the Mesozoic. So uh, this playlist goes through the Morrison Formation in the Western United States and goes uh, through all of you know, the fossils known there. Um, but then I have another playlist which just sums up, you know, if you were going to talk about the Mesozoic era, snakes are important. Crocodiles are important. I mean, some crocodiles were, were huge, heavier than even, you know, large meat-eating dinosaurs and arguably a major um, uh, uh, predator, especially, um, you know, the Mesosuchian uh, uh, dinosaurs. Um, pterosaurs uh, were reptiles which dominated the air. Um, they evolved in the Mesozoic and died in the Mesozoic, so they are specific to uh, uh, the Mesozoic. Um, flowers originated in uh, the Mesozoic, so the first flowering plants are from that uh, time period. It, so, and then obviously mammals originated in the Mesozoic, the first mammals. So the point is that it's wonderful to focus on dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are really, um, uh, you know, are a fascinating group of animals. Um, but the Mesozoic era gave birth to so many other groups, not just the dinosaurs, the pterosaurs, the mammals, diverse groups of marine reptiles, turtles, crocodiles, snakes, flowers, teleost fish. Um, and so therefore, uh, to think of the Mesozoic as the age of reptiles or the age of dinosaurs is not, uh, you know, entirely accurate. And we're missing the significance of all of those other uh, groups. Also, as stated before, the Mesozoic, you know, spanned an enormous uh, uh, time uh, length. And so all of these groups, whether they be dinosaurs or pterosaurs, some are known from the Triassic, some are known from the Jurassic, some from the early Cretaceous, some from the late uh, uh, Cretaceous. And so um, one would, you know, need to study, you know, what happened over the course of the Mesozoic to get, you know, a true appreciation of uh, this uh, group. Now, one of the things that has long been known is the movement of continents was uh, important, you know, for an appreciation of the Mesozoic era. Um, in fact, uh, one of the first evidences that the continents all occurred uh, together is the fact that you could get um, the same fossils, such as Lystrosaurus from the Triassic period of the Mesozoic, on all of 
you know, the southern continents, that you could get the same, you know, seed ferns, uh, etc. And so, um, at, at the southern continents for most of the Mesozoic were still united in that supercontinent uh, called uh, Pangaea. Um, uh, so, uh, as I'm sorry, I have a different plate mask, but we can find it here. Um, so, uh, uh, as uh, the Triassic period began, uh, all of the continents were joined together uh, to forming uh, Pangaea. Um, but that ended. And as it ended, then many of the continents took on their northern, uh, their, their modern forms. So if one considers Western North America, much of that owes its formation to, you know, these island continents fusing with uh, the mainland. So for example, think of, you know, perhaps New Guinea today. I mean, it's huge, all right? But it's not, you know, a continent. You could call it, say, a microcontinent or a terrain is, co is commonly used. Well, it seems that when you look at continental beds, that lots of what we now refer to, let's say, North America, um, was these microcontinents which fused to a larger land mass as plates moved. And so Western North America seems to have formed in stages as separate land masses fused with it and amalgamated with it. And we see this all throughout uh, the world. And very often when plates uh, form, this causes them to rise, forming mountain ranges. And so there are separate time periods in which there was mountain building, say, in the Western United States during the Mesozoic um, era. So, you know, these mountains made from the Jurassic to the Cretaceous, others made uh, during the Cretaceous. So as plates collide with each other, so this Farallon plate, which has almost disappeared today, um, went underneath the North American plate. Um, uh, it, uh, much of its material uh, then uh, accumulated uh, as uh, these, uh, uh, these mountain ranges. So if you were to study the Rockies um, and uh, much of Western North America, uh, it would be the movement of, of, of these giant plates during the, uh, the Mesozoic era, which would have given rise to that. In the same way, much of Southern North America, so the state of Florida and much of the, the Southeastern United States used to be attached to Gondwana, used to be attached to the Southern continents, um, but then uh, all of the land masses uh, fused to make Pangaea. And then when they separated in the Triassic, the land masses were the and remained attached to the um, So we're studying North America, we need to study the plate tectonics which occurred during the, um, the Mesozoic uh, uh, to account, you know, for all of, uh, uh, for all of uh, much of Mexico, uh, the southern uh, United States, uh, 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 separate uh, uh, which occurred during uh, the American uh, There were no polar ice caps during the Mesozoic era. So even though it's normal for us today for ice to be at the North Pole and ice to cover Antarctica at the South Pole, that was not the case in uh, the Mesozoic. And without those polar ice caps, uh, then sea level was higher. And so North America was divided into separate land masses separated by a shallow seaway. So for example, Tyrannosaurus rex is only known from this part of North America, not all parts, because this seaway limited its uh, distribution. And if one were to look for fossils in the middle of the United States, which is dry land today, one finds aquatic reptiles, large aquatic um, you know, uh, mosasaurs, they were lizards, diving birds, pterosaurs, lots of um, of sea life, and at different points in the Mesozoic era, then uh, this uh, closed off uh, or became anoxic. Um, now still, you, once again, you can find fossils of marine life. Say you were to go to Kansas, as in this area uh, here, in the area of Castle Rock, uh, where there's a limestone which was formed during this time. You can also then, you know, find many petroleum uh, digging uh, wells. Now, why would that be? Because petroleum is formed in marine environments, but Western North America uh, did have that interior seaway. And when one looks at fossils one finds or looks at limestone cliffs and fossil beds, these were then formed during uh, that uh, time. So once again, if you were to, to study the land masses today, even like inland North America, like uh, Kansas, um, you know, an understanding of uh, the Mesozoic. So for example, when sea level was much higher because there was no uh, ice roll, uh, frozen at the 
uh, the poles, uh, then much of North America uh, formed this seaway. Um, and so uh, this kind of brings us uh, to then the final topic of uh, extinctions, including the extinctions of the Mesozoic era. So it should be remembered that the Mesozoic era was born in the aftermath of the worst extinction in the history of life on Earth. So at the end of the Permian period, if you were to look at the diversity of life, whether they be you know, uh, marine organisms, even the last of the trilobites, many of these um, uh, brachiopods, bryozoans, the pereosaurs, the lycopod, you know, forests, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, so the Permian period had, you know, all of these diverse Paleozoic uh, forms. But then two things were happening. Um, one was uh, finally the continents were uh, amassing together uh, to form that supercontinent of uh, Pangaea. Now that had, uh, you know, occurred over tens and tens of millions of years. It was finally completing in the Permian period. Um, but that would have affected so many things, including the distribution of water. For a long time, there was a shallow seaway separating the northern and southern uh, land masses, but that then um, closed. So if you were to go uh, to the uh, end of the Paleozoic and uh, when the Mesozoic era began, uh, these continents had just uh, you know, finished uh, fusing together, which would have affected rainfall, which would have lost this entire seaway, might have affected the climate of the planet because now the distribution of water over uh, the land uh, would have uh, been important. Um, also, this was a shallow seaway, but now it was not only becoming dry land, but it was becoming the Appalachian Mountains because as Africa and North America came together, what used to be coast and seaway was now becoming a prominent uh, mountain range. So this was built slowly um, because this fusion of the land masses became, uh, occurred uh, slowly, but certainly this was having an impact on life on Earth. And at um, the point 250 million years ago, the worst um, volcanic eruptions known in Earth's history occurred in um, in Asia forming these vast lava uh, beds known as uh, the Siberian Traps. It's thought that volcanic eruptions occurred for over a million uh, years, uh, producing just incredible amounts of lava. So one to four million cubic kilometers of lava covering two million square uh, kilometers. Uh, and so, uh, it was in this backdrop that the Paleozoic era ends and more than 90% of the Paleozoic uh, life had disappeared. This was the worst mass extinction in the uh, history of the world, that which occurred in the end of the Permian. So between the Siberian traps and uh, you know, the final you know, effects of the fusion of Pangaea, um, that certainly had a great effect. And then the new Mesozoic era begins um, with the Triassic period. Now, in the uh, Triassic period, now we get you know, the, the first uh, turtles, the first um, marine uh, reptiles, the first flying pterosaurs, the first mammals, the first uh, dinosaurs. So the Triassic is this rich period, including many groups which are no longer, which didn't laugh last after the Triassic. So these big Rauisuchians, which were dominant uh, reptilian predators um, uh, before the dinosaurs became um, uh, major uh, uh, predators. Okay. Um, but then after 50 million years, the Triassic period ends and the major um, uh, uh, event happening um, is great volcanic eruptions uh, here. And I apologize. I, I wrote the wrong word, that was my bad. So um, there is an uh, area here known as the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, not magnetic, my bad. Um, so the Magmatic uh, uh, Province, where as this continent uh, starts to separate and the southern land masses go south and the northern land masses go north, there would have been a great deal of volcanic activity. Um, perhaps not as great as the Siberian traps in volume, but greater in terms of overall area. Um, as a result, uh, if you were to list the worst five extinctions, uh, the first, the worst five mass extinctions of the past 500 million years, the end Triassic extinction 
uh, which uh, occurred as these continents began to drift apart and the um, uh, and the Atlantic Ocean began uh, to form, this would rank in the top five. So um, the Mesozoic era and the Triassic period uh, begin with the worst mass extinction, but 50 million years later, there's another uh, significant mass extinction, one of the worst five in the history of the world. And a lot of these Triassic animals then become extinct. In the aftermath, dinosaurs become very successful. Um, but in the Triassic, once again, they had been one of many reptilian groups, not yet the dominant uh, uh, group. And so the Triassic gave birth to many organisms, but many like the placodonts and many of the marine reptiles, they uh, first uh, occur in the Triassic period, but they don't survive the mass extinction. The big Rauwusukians don't survive the mass uh, extinction, but the dinosaurs do, the phytosaurs, which look like crocodiles, uh, but which weren't, don't survive the mass extinction. So that's a very significant event in the Mesozoic era. One of the uh, big five mass uh, extinctions occurs at the end of the Triassic. The dinosaurs thrive in the Jurassic, they thrive in the Cretaceous, um, but then obviously 65 million years ago, uh, the Cretaceous period ends in a mass extinction, which does in many groups, including the dinosaurs. Um, and then this then uh, gives rise to the Cenozoic era 65 million years ago, which we sometimes call the age of mammals. Um, why did the dinosaurs become extinct? Well, certainly there have been lots of ideas. So for example, maybe mammals you know, evolved and were really good at eating dinosaur eggs. Uh, so I'm sure you know, everything that I'm about to say to, is true to a certain degree. But mammals are old. Mammals actually dated back to the Triassic uh, period. Um, and so uh, dinosaurs had been living alongside mammals for over 150 million years. So uh, the idea that you know, suddenly 65 million years ago, mammals started eating all the dinosaur eggs in a way that they hadn't you know, in the past 150 million years, um, perhaps not as uh, realistic. Uh, one could say, oh, but, you know, flowers were becoming abundant at the end of the Cretaceous, like there were magnolia flowers, they were replacing, you know, the largely gymnosperm um, uh, vegetation previously. Well, that's certainly true, but if one considers the duck-billed dinosaurs, the horned dinosaurs, these were plant-eating dinosaurs, and they were doing great. So they evolved in the late Cretaceous and then diversified enormously in the late Cretaceous. So if vegetation was changing, it wasn't changing in a way which was, you know, wiping out plant-eating dinosaurs. If anything, plant-eating dinosaurs were pro uh, producing lots of new uh, lineages at um, at the time. Some have said other things like maybe the climate, you know, changed and that wiped out dinosaurs. Or maybe since some reptiles uh, determine the gender of the uh, offspring in the nest by temperature. So this is true. So if you take turtle eggs um, and you split uh, turtle eggs in half and incubate half at a warmer temperature and a half at a colder temperature, you can have all males in one uh, batch and all females in uh, another batch. If dinosaurs were like that, then maybe the temperature changed and then you had all female dinosaurs and they all died. Well, remember that dinosaurs lived at the equator, lived in Antarctica, lived north of the Arctic Circle. So dinosaurs had already adapted to a planet worth of diverse temperatures. Um, and so, you know, once again, one could make an argument against, you know, a, a temperature change, you know, suddenly uh, dooming uh, dinosaurs. Also then finally, it wasn't just the dinosaurs that die at the end of the Cretaceous. The last of the pterosaurs perish at the end of the Cretaceous period. Um, many of the marine reptiles like plesiosaurs and um, uh, the mosasaur uh, lizards, uh, they die at, at the end of the Cretaceous. But then one can even see the effects on microscopic marine life. If you're studying the microscopic marine life of the ocean, you can see the clear demarcation where the Mesozoic era ends and the Cenozoic era begins because you know, all of these things like the, the coccolithophores, uh, which pr uh, help produce the calcium for the, the chalk. So Cretaceous literally is derived from the Latin word for chalk, 
because there's so much chalk deposited during the Cretaceous because of these microorganisms in the ocean which were depositing chalk. Well, many of, of those become extinct. So whatever causes the extinction at the end of the Mesozoic era, it wasn't something like a virus which affected the dinosaurs. Um, it affected birds. The most common birds of the time, the enantiornithine birds, they die. Many plants die. Marine life dies, including microscopic marine life um, dies. Many Mesozoic mammal groups uh, disappear. So whatever it is, it was a global phenomenon which affected many organisms, including the uh, dinosaurs. So what might have led to this? Well, there are two leading contenders, and one doesn't have to choose between either of them because if both of them happened at the same time, they were both bad, so maybe it was the combination which proved so deadly. India, for the longest time, had been attached to the southern land masses as part of Gondwana. So today, India is part of Asia, but in the past 500 million years, it has been a southern land mass for the majority of that, being attached to Africa and Madagascar. But late in the Cretaceous, then, it began to move. And as far as land masses move, this may be the most rapid migration which is known. Now, we're not talking miles an hour, you know, by any means, but continents tend to move very slowly. India's movement is about as fast a movement as has been registered. And um, this resulted in volcanic activity uh, causing the Deccan traps, large masses of uh, of lava, et cetera. Not as bad as the Siberian traps, but the second worst, you know, in, in, term, in terms of volume. So if the Siberian traps at the end of the Permian, the, wor the, the, the biggest volcanic eruption in known history caused the biggest extinction, it's not that, you know, uh, unrealistic that the Deccan traps, which could be associated with perhaps the second or third biggest period of volcanic activity would be associated with the second worst extinction in the past um, uh, 500 million years. So that was happening 65 million years ago. And then this happened. A rock or a comet, probably a rock, but you know, some sort of extraterrestrial object, maybe about five kilometers wide or so, um, struck the earth. Now maybe more than one rock struck the earth. I mean, uh, must, much of the earth is water. And so something could strike an ocean and not leave much of an impact. Um, but in the Yucatan Peninsula, where Mexico and Guatemala meet, um, there is a crater from 65 million years ago um, where uh, a large extraterrestrial object uh, struck uh, the earth. Something this large would have had devastating impacts. There's evidence of tsunamis along the coast of North America. There's evidence of you know, just a, um, a global distribution of radioactive elements. So um, iridium is a radioactive element which is at a higher level uh, in association with meteorite impacts. And all over the world, the, um, uh, the boundary between the Cretaceous period and the beginning of the Cenozoic era then is marked by an elevated spike in iridium. At meteorite impact sites and at atomic blast sites, uh, you can have quartz grains which have these impact impressions on them called shocked quartz. That's associated with the Cretaceous, um, at the end of the Cretaceous period. Uh, and so something seems to have hit the planet at that time. And the effects you know, probably would have been devastating as so much ejecta came up and then came back down, just as you know, meteorites burn up as they enter the atmosphere, um, that all of this material burning up would have elevated uh, temperature. This one uh, study that was produced, um, it came to the conclusion, not oven hot, but rather say pizza oven hot. The earth you know, briefly got to that you know, temperature. Um, and this caused the extinction of an estimated 60% of the life that was on earth and probably would have had um, impacts long after that. So there's, you know, there's a site in Antarctica where there's a big fish kill where like a whole lot of fish skeletons all from that period. So a lot of life probably died at once. Um, but then over a longer period, this ejecta might have blocked out the sun and then uh, resulted in, um, you know, a shading and, and some have reported that there is an elevation of say fern spikes or, or fern spores um, 
as suggesting that you know the earth was clouded for uh, a bit. So um, the Mesozoic era begins with a mass extinction, um, which was at uh, the end of the Permian. Uh, there was another mass extinction 50 million years later in the Triassic period. And then the Mesozoic era ends with the end Cretaceous extinction. Now, lots of things go extinct, all right? So, you know, passenger pigeons went extinct, et cetera. Uh, so things can go extinct from time to time, but there are um, times in Earth's history where so much life is going extinct at one time that we refer to it as a mass extinction. And so when we refer to the Mesozoic era, three of the, of the five biggest mass extinctions of the past 500 million years occurred in the Mesozoic or thereabouts. And so um, the worst mass extinction occurred at the end of the Permian, and that ended the Paleozoic era. So much of its life died. The old life, Paleozoic means old life, its life becomes extinct. And then that began the Mesozoic era, which means middle life. So it begins with a mass extinction. There's a mass extinction at the end of the Triassic period, which dramatically changes life on Earth, and the dinosaurs thrive in the aftermath. But then 65 million years ago, a combination of tectonic plate movements, you know, causing the Deccan traps and other things, plus a meteorite impact, um, then causes the extinction of 60% of life on Earth at uh, the time. And so then, you know, as the early geologists classified life, they said, you know, life changes here. And all of a sudden we see fauna dominated by large mammals and flowering plants that we just didn't see here. So that's why this has a name of a, of a new era for recent life, the Cenozoic era, because so much of the life of the Mesozoic died at this mass extinction and that the world then reinvented itself and lots of new diverse uh, groups uh, evolved. All right, and so uh, this lecture that I give just kind of sums up, you know, some general thoughts about dinosaurs and some general thoughts about the Mesozoic uh, era as my students wrap up the unit on uh, the Mesozoic era.